Duluth is our hometown. We are born and raised in Duluth, Minnesota, and we're really proud of that. If I'm up in the Duluth office, in the fifth floor conference room, one of my favorite spaces, and I can look out and I just see the beauty of Lake Superior, it's stunning. I look down and around and I can see all of the ways that LHB has touched that city. It makes me feel good because this is where we started, right on the shores of Lake Superior. The firm started because Lauren Larson, the L and LHB, opened Larson Engineering. Harvey joined, Harvey Harvilla. Shortly after that, Robert Burquist rode into town on his Harley. He somehow convinced Lauren and Harvey to hire him in their firm. They rebranded the firm from Larson and Harvilla Structural Engineers to Larson, Harvilla, and Burquist Engineers and Architects. In 1991, Rick and his small office staff really started our road on sustainability. We decided that our focus was going to be on energy efficiency, occupant health, and resource efficiency. So this is long before the US GBC, the US Green Building Council, or the LEED system. It was a relatively new science, but you know we found people that were the experts and we started to try and figure out how to understand it and apply it to our work. The launching of the focus on environmental or green or healthy building design, which happened in 1991, and the nearly simultaneous launch into doing affordable housing, mostly single family for nonprofits. The way that they merged was Habitat for Humanity Twin Cities, which is, always has been one of the major leaders in affordable housing in the country. Steven Seidel, who was the executive director at the time, called and said, we have an opportunity. A developer in St. Paul wants to build on a block that eventually was called Leighton Park Place, 21 single family homes. And, and this was a magic idea that has been leveraged many times since. This developer, David Van Lanschute at Justin Properties realized if he got Habitat to build seven houses without needing any subsidy, he could build 14 houses and have higher quality homes for people in need. It was a catapult into the affordable housing world. If you take all of the people in our housing studio and you count up the units that they've been involved in designing, we've designed over 17,000 units of affordable housing. motivation for affordable housing goes back to really wanting to see everyone in our community succeed. We think of affordable housing in our work as this needs to be a quality place to live and a building that's contributing to the larger community. One of the projects that we recently completed is Dorothy Day Place, an opportunity center. It's a, a partner program with Higher Ground St. Paul, both for Catholic charities um, located in downtown St. Paul provides services and housing for homeless individuals. If they're welcomed into the shelter, there is an opportunity to move up onto upper floors uh, in more stable shelter and then up further into units on the upper floors. And that's, that's a really exciting trajectory and it's a really exciting experience and sort of program for the way that uh, Catholic Charities operates that building or that campus as a whole. By us listening and hearing where they're coming from, them knowing that we are hearing what the needs are, helps to build that trust. Good architecture can help to mend community and bring people together that might otherwise not interact. One of the things that ties all of our work together is our desire to design with the community at heart. Our design process actually starts by talking to community members to people who are going to be using our spaces eventually. We might have 30 to 30 to 50 people in a room and these individuals play with these scale size blocks and organize them and arrange them in a way that they think would fit and work well for whatever their perspective approaches. We then have them present those back to us. 
It's about making sure that you get as many different perspectives involved in that design process as possible so that that design can continue to improve and get better. There's a sincerity and a curiosity that LHB brings to that process that shows, that's palpable, that the public feels. I think one of the benefits of working with the community partners is so often many of them have goals that are in line with LHB's sustainability and regenerative goals. One of the projects we're working on and we have an re ongoing relationship with is the Hmong American Farmers Association, also known as HAFA. I think about, you know, regenerative agriculture. You know, they practice a form of regenerative agriculture that saves tons of carbon every year. That's not something LHB could have gone out and done on our own, but by supporting them, we're able to make sure that their farm is viable long-term in order to really support the great work that they are doing. None of us is an, is an island. None of these organizations that we work with are on islands. It's our responsibility to share what we know and help the whole community improve. So in 2006, we decided to start tracking the data on our building projects. Performance metrics is a system to measure building performance, you know, from energy to water use to a number of factors. If you can measure it, now you have a baseline, now you can try to improve on it. Measuring outcomes in our buildings led to the Regional Indicators Initiative just a few years later. We expanded that to the city and community scale where we now collect that data for over 100 cities. Cities all the time are creating comprehensive plans. What if they could set performance goals for the city and everything being designed and built in that city would then contribute to that performance goal. In other words, you draw a line around a city, it's within a boundary, citywide water, waste, travel, energy use, and greenhouse gas emissions. As we look back on it, this time at LHB was when we really built the infrastructure that enabled us to do everything we've done since. We started a project about a year and a half ago that will be the most sustainable regenerative community if not on the planet, certainly in Minnesota, it's called Hillcrest. It's a decommissioned 118 acre golf course that the client wants to build. A million square feet of commercial space and a million square feet of residential space. But what's unique about it is they want the entire project to be carbon neutral. You have to actually produce as much renewable energy on the site that you use for all the buildings and all the transportation. And we've actually charted out a course by doing the math and bringing the partners to the table and conceptualizing the systems to be able to do that. We know how much it will cost, we know how to do it, and the client seems intent on doing it. If it happened, if it happened today, it'd be the first one in the world. It's important not only for LHB, it's important for our profession and for our world. So I think some of the lessons we've learned in the last 30 years will be really applicable. You know, this idea of having a destination and not being afraid to draw the map as we go, that's what we all have to be able to do. And I'm confident that we're prepared for that. Thank you.